All right, so welcome to uh, getting started with Model Builder. Uh, my name is Leah Saunders and uh, I work for Esri. I'm a solution engineer out of our uh, Seattle, uh, Washington office. And I've uh, been with the company for just over 10 years, doing all sorts of things. So, um, but I always seem to come back to the conference and end up doing something with geoprocessing and model builder and working the spatial analysis island. So I think that's maybe where my, my heart is. I'm not sure. Um, so how many of you are new this year to the conference? First time? Okay, good. Okay, I always like to kind of check it out and see. Hopefully you're enjoying it and uh, getting lots of information. So the next 75 minutes, we're going to be sort of talking about Model Builder and how to get started and uh, what you can do with it. Um, and then after, if you, you know, want uh, more information, there's additional sessions and then you can always come down to the Spatial Analysis Island and we have a bunch of Model Builder and geoprocessing experts down there. So uh, come and hit us up for some more information. So the agenda for the next little while, uh, while you're here with me, we're going to go over uh, the basics of geoprocessing. What is it? Um, and then we'll get into model builder itself, how to create some model tools, and then a few tips for designing and sharing your models. Okay, and I have some additional resources at the end just to kind of get you going uh, once you step out of this room and you know you're actually going to start, start to work with it. So a basic geoprocessing overview. Um, what is geoprocessing? So how many of you, when you hear geoprocessing, think buffers and clips and unions, some traditional sort of GIS geoprocessing tools, right? Um, so, I mean, that's where I come from. Um, but over the years, we've kind of expanded this definition to mean more like a system for managing and manipulating any kind of spatial data or maybe tabular data relating to spatial issues. Um, so we're able to solve real-world problems um, or real-world spatial problems with this and um, model our processes and systems and things like that. And then, you know, we generally have a lot of questions and that's why we're doing this stuff. So we want to get results and we can use the geoprocessing sort of environment to do that. So the geoprocessing language itself is really kind of sitting in tools. Um, so we have many different toolboxes with tool sets and tools that do specific functions or multiple functions. And then you have your individual tools, um, like clip tool, raster calculator, and so on. Lots of different tools, okay? And uh, you get different tools with extensions, different tools with uh, different levels of ArcGIS desktop. Um, so that's really our geoprocessing language, is working with these tools themselves. Now, the geoprocessing framework um, is, is sort of these different environments that we can use these tools in, that we can kind of work in. Um, so you can open up a tool itself and explicitly put in the parameters and, and click OK and away you go. Um, or what we're going to be looking at this afternoon is pulling these tools um, to create sort of a process and model builder. Okay. Um, we also have the Python window. So if you're using ArcGIS 10, we added this window so that you can quickly type in Python commands. Right? and use the tools in there. Um, you can also take that one step further and go into a scripting environment. Right? So you can write more than just one um, sort of geoprocessing uh, command or tool and write an entire script to do all of that work. So these four pieces, the tools, the model builder, Python window, and the scripting environment, all sort of are what we use in the geoprocessing framework, okay? or what we refer to as the framework itself. Finding tools. Um, so you've probably noticed by now I'm working in ArcGIS 10 by these screenshots. Um, so we added a few different things at, at 10 so that you can actually search for tools. Um, maybe versions before that you, you'd like to go to your Arc toolbox and go and find some tools in there. Well, we've added a geoprocessing menu at 10 so that you can get some of the very common tools, buffer tools, clip tools, things like that. Um, things that you may use quite often. Um, we also have the catalog window, and in the catalog window you can access all of the toolboxes, the system toolboxes, as well as uh, any custom toolboxes that you create. 
And then the one thing that I really have, have become very um, accustomed to using and, and really enjoy now is the search window. So the search window allows you to search for not only tools, but also maps and data by little keywords. Okay? Um, so I'll show you an example of you know, not just looking for a clip tool by its name, but we can also use alternative names or descriptive names um, when we're searching for tools. On that geoprocessing menu, we do have some geoprocessing options as well. So I, I kind of put this in the beginning so that way you have an idea of where to get some of this information as you start to use the geoprocessing uh, framework. So on the geoprocessing options, a couple important things that I want to point out. One is the ability to overwrite the outputs of operations. So um, that's the checkbox at the very top of the dialog, and this allows you to go ahead and overwrite outputs of previous geoprocessing operations. Um, the real use of this is if you have to run a model or two multiple times and you're testing things, you may not want to go and have to clean it up. You may just want to overwrite and move on, right? Uh, so you can go ahead and do that. I definitely recommend logging your geoprocessing operations to a log file. If you call tech support and uh, you have a problem with geoprocessing, they may ask you, do you have a log file for this? That's really beneficial for, for you um, to log your processes as well as to give to tech support or um, other, other um, people supporting you in this. Um, Model Builder has specifically one individual option that I'll, I'll go over a little later on that has to do with connecting pieces in Model Builder. Um, also, you may want to check out the results management options. So you, when you run geoprocessing tools, you get these results, and then you can go ahead and decide how long you want to keep those results. Okay, so the default is two weeks, but you can go um, beyond that, months, two months, or you can say, I only want to keep it for the day. Okay. So it's up to you how you, how you want to do that. All right, there's a few other little options at the bottom. So definitely go and check out the geoprocessing options um, on the geoprocessing menu in ArcMap or Arc Catalog. All right, so let's take a look at this. So here I just have a, a map of uh, Jefferson County in Kentucky. And... Um, very simple map, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of ignore some of this stuff and, and just give you the, uh, the overview of how to find some tools in uh, ArcGIS. So one of the first things I talked about was this geoprocessing menu. Um, so we can find you know, six of our most common sort of geoprocessing tools. Um, we also have the ability to get to our geoprocessing options dialog on that drop down. Okay? Um, something else that we can do is open up the catalog window. So this is a nice little window inside of ArcMap, and I can get to all my toolboxes inside this window, right? So we have system toolboxes and then your custom toolboxes. No search capability right here, so you have to know where you're going. So if I'm going to look for my buffer, I need to know that it's in the proximity tool set. However, if you're not too sure where a tool is, you want to be able to search, um, you can use the new search window in ArcGIS 10. So as I said, it takes not only um, the name of a tool, so if I know it's called Clip, I just don't know where it is, I can type in Clip and have it go and search. Okay? But if I'm relatively new to the software or new to GIS, I may not know that it's called Clip. Right? I just know that this is a cookie cutter type of function. Okay, um, so I can actually type in cookie and get the clip tool. So there's been some, some intelligence built into this search to be able to search through the description and, and other information that's put with the tool. So that way, you know, you can search by common names, by things that are, are a little more descriptive as opposed to just the actual full name um, in there. So I think this is pretty neat, right? Nice stuff. Right, so that's how we can sort of get started with uh, geoprocessing and, and searching for tools. So the basis for my demonstrations today in that Kentucky map um, is because I need to solve a, a problem. Um, I, I tend to focus a lot on public safety in my, in my region, um, so this is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, we have a scenario here where 
We need to prioritize the schools in the area for emergency shelter planning. We tend to use these schools as uh, shelters in cases of emergency um, because they have larger areas and rooms that we can kind of put people. However, we do have a lot of uh, schools in the area that are in what we would call vulnerable areas. Um, so these vulnerable areas could be uh, within 2,600 uh, feet of a hazmat route right? Um, within 2,600 feet of a hazardous facility and also within uh, a flood hazard area. Okay, so we have some flooding potential there. So these three items here, um, I need to make sure that the schools are far enough away from these that uh, they can be used for emergency shelters. Okay, so this is our scenario for today, and this is really what we're going to be working on um, throughout the rest of the, the workshop and creating a model to, to find these potential schools for our shelters. Right. So I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of what that looks like. And just to give you an idea of the final model, okay, so this is what our final model is. Uh, it does a few different things. We have four specific tools in here. One is to buffer our hazmat routes. Um, another is to buffer our hazardous facilities. And then we're going to overlay those two outputs and uh, union them with the uh, flooding areas. And that'll give us our, vul our vulnerable areas uh, within the, the county. And then I want to go and find all of the schools that are not within those vulnerable areas. So I'm going to use the erase tool to do that. And then my output is going to be the schools that I could use as potential shelters. So that's the process that we're going to go through uh, when we go ahead and build the actual model. Okay? And this is essentially what we're going to be looking at later on. But I'd like to give you an overview of the model first, and then we can start to put all the pieces together right? and build it from scratch so that you don't think I'm you know, pulling some smoke and mirrors there when I, when I work through this. Right? All right. So getting started with Model Builder itself, um, why would you want to use Model Builder, right? You can go and open up a buffer tool and run it. You can open up the same buffer tool again, run it on some different data, right? You have um, the ability to open up all these tools and, and run them and um, put a little bit of intelligence into them. But there is some distinct advantages of using Model Builder. Um, one is it's, it's a way of encapsulating workflows, right? Making reusable and shareable processes. Okay? If you went to the plenary session on Monday, um, you may have seen uh, Lauren uh, Rosenshine doing something on spatial statistics and showing the new 10.1 tools. She created a model and she was able to go and share that model um, of her methodology to somebody in Denver. And then he was able to go ahead and reuse that model and apply it to his own data. Right? So she did all of this work. Why not be able to share that and rerun that? Okay? So that's a sort of a, a reason why we want to use Mono Builder, um, automating and managing uh, workflows, um, running a complex succession of processes in one tool. I may have 15 tools that I have to run, and I have to do that once a month. Right? I have to remember then the succession of those tools, right? Why not put it into a model and then have the software kind of do the work for me, right? Write it once, run it as many times as I want to. Um, another reason is that you can actually go and create a model and then sort of change little things to match what you need to do when you run it the next time. So if I need to add another tool or I need to change a parameter, you can kind of do that um, very easily if, once you have the base model. And then lastly, um, being able to have a visual representation of your work. Okay. Um, again, back to Monday, you know, when Lauren did the spatial statistics, uh, she showed that she created a report and the methodology of how she got the results that she did. And in that report, she actually put in the image of the model. Okay. So a nice graphical way of showing your methodology and what you went through to get the results that you did. Because right? so a lot of times people ask us, well, what did you go through to do that? Okay, we have to kind of justify um, some, some of our processes there. So before we really get started in Model Builder, um, I need to kind of point out uh, something in, in ArcGIS, and that is the types of toolboxes that you have available to you. 
Um, one is the system toolboxes. So these are the toolboxes that are installed with the software, right? They are read-only toolboxes. You cannot go and add additional pieces to them. Um, this read-only is, is really a good thing because this is the stuff that gets installed with the software and you want it to be running all the time or working for you all the time. Um, so if we were to give you the ability to mess around with them a little bit, we might give you the potential to mess up those toolboxes. Okay. Um, so the toolboxes that you get to go and play with and add new tools to and whatever else you want um, are the custom toolboxes. Okay, so these are your user-created toolboxes. Um, they're stored either in a folder as a TBX file or inside of a geodatabase. And that can even be an enterprise geodatabase if you choose. Okay, so you can keep the actual toolbox with your data um, or you can kind of put it aside. So why am I telling you this? Well, when we make models, we are making our own new tools. And we need a toolbox to put those models in. And that would be our own custom toolbox. So a couple different ways to start a brand new model. Uh, one is to go and click on the Model Builder button on the ArcMap Standard Toolbar. Looks like the little icon that you're seeing on the left side of the slide. Um, so this opens up a brand new uh, Model Builder window. And then you can go and create a model and save that from there. Um, the other way to do this is to go into a custom toolbox, right click, and choose new model. That again opens up your model builder window, and now you can go and start to work on your model. Okay. So, first thing I like to do when I go and create a new model is actually go to the model properties um, and open that up and start to set up my properties, right? So I create my name which cannot have spaces, okay? Um, the label, however, is what actually appears in a toolbox, and that can have spaces. But make it nice and descriptive, right? So that if you're looking at it later on or you give this toolbox to somebody, um, they can see basically, you know, by the name what it might do. Uh, in addition to that, it's always a good practice to go ahead and put in a description. Okay, as much of a description as you possibly can. Um, that's definitely helpful when sharing models. And then the other option towards the bottom of the, the model properties general tab is relative paths. So hopefully you're kind of familiar with relative paths and map documents, right? So if I open up um, a map document and I have it on my E drive and I save that and I save it with relative paths, somebody else can open it up on a D drive and it won't necessarily break the data. Okay, and this is the same for models. Models use data and use tools. So they do carry paths around with, with them to that information. So another thing that um, I like to go over before we start to actually create a model is the idea of environments and environment settings. So these are sort of the default settings that you can have um, that go with your tools or in your applications, um, such as workspaces, whether it's a scratch workspace or a current workspace that your data is coming from. Um, you can also set up a, uh, an environment setting for a coordinate system. Okay, um, so if you usually work in one particular coordinate system, then you can set that up as sort of your default coordinate system, right? Um, it's important to know sort of the hierarchy of how environment settings are, are distributed. So at the very top, in number one here, we have the application settings. So these environment settings or defaults are set at the application level. That would be ArcMap or Arc Catalog. Then any tool that is run within that application um, actually inherits those application settings. However, they can be overrided. So if you um, set an arc map that your coordinate system is going to be some particular, if you're in the United States, state plane, um, say I'm in Oregon, uh, but then I need to run a tool that's going to run some data on Washington, um, I can actually go and open up that tool and override that Oregon setting in that tool just for that time that I'm running it. Okay? That's the same for models. So models themselves have environment settings on them. Okay, but then the actual model processes, the, the tools that are inside Model Builder, um, you can override the model settings with those. Okay, so I'll kind of show you what this looks like. All right, let's go ahead and start to make a model. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and create my own brand new toolbox. So we have 
tools here, and I'm going to right click and say new toolbox. So if you see 2011, all right, so there's my brand new toolbox, and I'm going to go ahead and right click on that and say new model, and now I have a brand new model. Okay. So the first thing I, I like to do, as I said, is go to the actual model properties. So we can go to the general tab, and I'm going to give this a name. All right. Remember, names can't have spaces. But what I am going to do is go ahead and make the label basically the same, just add a space in there, right? Make it simple. Then I can add a description. Um, model to find possible school shelters. Oops. All right. Obviously, if I had more time, I'd probably put in more of a description in there. And then I'm going to store relative paths because I may go and give this to somebody else at a neighboring county um, who, who might want to run the same sort of analysis. We have some additional tabs here, which I'll, I'll cover a little later on. So we have parameters. Um, so what I'm going to do next, though, is go and look at my environment settings. Okay? So these environment settings are on the model settings themselves. Right? Um, and I'm going to choose which settings I want to set. So in this case, I'm looking at the workspace settings, and I'm going to go and grab my current and scratch. I'm going to hit values. And here I have my current workspace and scratch workspace. Now notice they're already filled in. This model has inherited the application settings. So in the actual application I set up to grab my data from the model data.gdb and to use a scratch.gdb workspace as my scratch workspace. So I'm just going to leave those because that's okay for my model. If I wanted to override it, I would just go ahead and change um, these values in here. All right. So now we have our vulnerability model. Again, it's looking at the label here. And we could go ahead to start to build um, our actual process. So just to give you a quick review of what we looked at for the model that we're going to be building, again, I need to create a couple buffers on my hazardous uh, facilities and my hazmat routes. And then I'm going to go and use a union tool to pull all, that, all those hazardous or uh, vulnerable areas together. And then I'm going to go ahead and have the software find the, the schools that are not inside of that vul those vulnerable areas. Okay. So we'll go back in here to Model Builder, and I'm going to go and start to build. So I can find tools and add tools in a few different ways. Um, if I know where the tools are, what toolbox is, I can go ahead and just find those. So here I'm in my system tools, uh, or system toolbox, and I can go to my analysis and proximity, and there's my buffer tool. Okay. So I can just drag and drop onto this environment. Um, I also have the ability to go and hit the add data or tool and go and grab the tool from there as well. Lots of different options. So then I'm going to fill in the information. And again, I can go and drag and drop data on here. So I can say I want my hazardous facilities on here. And then I can go ahead and use our connector tool to connect these pieces together. Okay, And these are going to be my input features. Now. The only colored in um, oval here is my blue oval, and that's my input data. These other pieces of my model or model elements are clear because this tool is not ready to run. So I need to go and put in some additional parameters into the buffer tool. So I can open up the buffer tool, um, set my output feature class. So this is going to be my um, buffer has facilities save and I can put in my distance so I'm going to put 2600 feet and then I can also change some of the optional parameters here okay. the tool only requires you um, to put in the required parameters in, in order to be ready to run okay so the optional are just that they are optional you don't have to fill them in in order to make the tool ready All right so now I have the buffer tool that is ready to run. Okay, everything's filled in nicely. I can go ahead and change some additional things. So I can rename this to, uh, let's say, uh, hazardous facilities buffer. All right, give it a little more descriptive name. It's always good to put as much information into these models as possible. So that way, if you have to share it or you leave your job and you leave behind this information, somebody else can quickly look at it and kind of get an idea of what it does, right? 
That's important. Right, so we need to add another buffer tool because I need to buffer my hazmat routes. So I'm gonna go ahead and search for it just so you can see how search works in here again. So we can do buffer, right? And then we can go and drag and drop from the search onto my model builder canvas. Okay, and I have some tools on the, on the toolbar here that allow me to sort of lay out my, my model and I can use the auto layout to have it kind of look nice. And then what I'm going to do in this buffer is just double click on it and fill in the information. So I want to now buffer my hazmat routes and I want to create an output for those. So we're going to do buffer hazmat routes. And again, I'm going to buffer by 2,600 feet. And again, I'm just going to dissolve these buffers. Okay. So now you'll see my other buffer tool is ready to run as well. And again, I can go ahead and change some of the, the sort of graphic looking information on here. So we'll say this is my hazmat routes buffer. All right. Okay, so far so good. All right, just added a couple tools. Okay. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do was go ahead and add the union tool. So I'm going to go ahead and search. I guess I don't necessarily know where that is. Oops. Okay, so we can go and grab our union tool and add this again to our model builder session here. And what I need to do now is go and um, connect these two outputs to the union tool and grab the uh, flood areas um, to union as well. So I can use my connection tool again and just draw a line and just draw another line. You notice I get a drop down box here. I'll show you in a, in a few minutes how to, how to get that. So that way you can determine if it's an input or you know what, what type of parameter it is that I'm filling in here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab my uh, flooding areas. Okay, put those on there and connect that as well as an input, okay. So now we can start to see how things are all connecting together. Again, the union tool is not ready to run at this point, so I need to go and fill in some other information. It grabbed my inputs for me, so that's great. And then I'm just gonna go and set my output, okay? And leave all of the rest of the options. Okay, so it's always a good thing to um, validate your models. We have a nice little tool here that says validate entire model. So we can click that and what it does is it checks to make sure that everything's connected okay, that I have my inputs that it can access so I can see them, um, that all of my parameters are filled in correctly and so on. Okay, so kind of a nice little way of just checking our tool. Uh, what is this doing here? I don't know why it's doing that. All right. Um, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to vulnerable areas, All right? And that's my output. So I'm going to go ahead and save this model. And what I want to do is add this final output to my display. And I'm having some weird behavior here. I don't know if it's my mouse or what. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so let's go ahead and just run this and see what happens. So cross your fingers, hope that everything works okay. So we hit run. You notice as I'm running the tool, um, things start to turn red and um, get highlighted. And then as these tools run, they actually get a drop down shadow behind them saying that they've been run already. So when they turn red, that's the tool that's actually being run. And then when they get the, the drop down, that means that the tool is in a already run state. Okay, so it's already been run. So now what I can do is um, go ahead and add that to my display. Okay, and there's the result of running those three tools. Okay. So you have a nice little option in Model Builder to add things to your display. Right, just by checking off add to display. Now, the nice thing about this too is that the model builder window actually does talk to the map. So if I forgot to do this before running the model, I can go and right click on it and add to display and it'll actually add that to the display if it's been run, okay? Or if I turn it off, it's gone again. Okay, kind of neat, right? All works together. Okay, so I've run these three tools. What I'm gonna do is actually go and validate this model 
so that I can set it backwards to a ready to run state, right? So that I can run it again, right? It's ready to go again. Now, before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and add that one last tool that I need in here, and that's the erase tool. And the erase tool is going to look for the schools um, that overlay those vulnerable areas and it's going to remove them from my result and just give me the schools that are not uh, overlaying those vulnerable areas. So we can go ahead and connect this to our erase. Right? And this is going to be my actual erase features. And then what I need to do is grab again my schools and put these on here and then link those up as my inputs. So we'll open up the erase and we need an output. Okay, so this is going to be my potential school shelters. I'm just going to overwrite that and I hit OK. All right. So now I'm going to make sure that this gets added to the display at the end. I'm going to do a quick rename of this. So um, potential shelters. Okay. And I'm going to do something else additional. So if you notice, if you run a tool, by default, it just kind of gives you whatever symbology it feels like, right? The software chooses something. Um, way back in the day, it used to always be brown. We always had brown colors. Um, now, who knows? Um, somebody has some fun with color palettes. Um, but what we can do on this is we can build some sort of intelligence into this actual output and use a layer file. You know those LYR files that we have? We've had them around for a few years. Um, we can go and use the symbology from a layer file that exists on disk and apply that symbology to my output. So I don't have to make the extra step once the tools run to go and symbolize it. The software will actually do it for me. Okay. So what we can do is go and uh, get into our oops, layers here and uh, non-vulnerable schools and now hit OK. So now what I can do is just go ahead and save this and we will just check to make sure everything's okay and we're going to run this tool. All right, so it's doing a buffer. It's doing the buffer of the hazmat routes, working through the union of the uh, hazardous possible areas and it went into the erase and away we go. And those are my schools that are left over. So. Just so that you believe me, we'll turn on the hazmat routes and we'll turn on the hazardous facilities and the flooding hazards. And if I go and zoom into an area here, all right, so now you can see all the schools that are, that are left over. Okay. Pretty neat. Good stuff, right? Okay. And we just did that all on the fly in just a few minutes. So pretty quick to get going with Model Builder. Um, a lot of extra options, but what I'm going to do right now is go back into the slides and then we can get into the extra options and putting in a little more um, fun into our models. Right. So I'm going to kind of fly through these slides because we, we've already discussed this and kind of seen what it is. Um, so the model elements, you have um, tools and variables and connectors um, that you have possibly on your actual model. Right. Adding tools and data to the model, um, you saw me drag and drop. Okay. Um, we can also use the add data or tool in the model builder window to go ahead and add information. Um, so it's pretty easy to get stuff onto that nice drag and drop environment. A couple different ways to connect elements. So I use the connector tool a few times to go and connect the data um, to the actual tools. But you can also go and double click the tool and open it up and fill in all the parameters, just like you would if you were to go and open up the tool outside of a model, right? Uh, and it'll go in and connect all the items together and pull data in if it's not on there. Uh, you have a couple different types of little ovals um, on your model. So you'll see the existing data are the blue ovals. So these are the things that I already had in my map or sitting on disk and I can go and drag them in. Um, and then on the, on the other side you have the derived data. So this is the data that's going to be output. right? And these are the green ovals on the model. 
So in terms of the tools and parameters, um, you have inputs and outputs and then a few other uh, possibilities. So in the buffer tool, we also have a distance that we need to fill in. As I said, you only have to fill in the required parameters on a tool in order to get that tool to run or be ready to run. Uh, if you uh, choose to fill in the optional, that's entirely up to you, but they will not affect whether or not that tool is ready to run. And just a tip in terms of connecting. Back on the geoprocessing options dialog that I showed you a little earlier on, you have an option in sort of the middle of the dialog uh, for model builder. And if you check that off, what happens when you connect your, your data elements uh, or your little blue ovals to the tools is it'll give you that drop down box that you saw and it'll allow you to determine what that Connect, that piece that's being connected is going to be used for in the model. So if you're connecting data to a buffer tool, um, you're probably using it as input uh, features. But there are some tools like the clip tool that take both an input and a clip, right? So you get the option on the fly very quickly as to whether or not that input data set is going to be the clip data set or the input um, feature. Okay, so a nice little way of quickly going through things rather than having to open up the dialog for the tool afterwards and checking to make sure everything is okay in there. The model states, uh, if, it is, if the model uh, tool and, and any of the ovals are clear or white, um, that means they're not ready to run. So if you try and run the model, nothing was going to happen. Um, what you do need to have is a ready to run state where everything is filled in and nice and, and colored. Uh, and then you can go ahead and run your model. If it has been run, you get the drop shadow. Okay, so you saw that I, I had a drop shadow once I run some of those tools. Um, and then if you want to reset that, you can go ahead and validate the model and reset the model to a ready to run state. And that brings us to the validating here. Okay, so if you validate and there is success, it'll return a model from has been run um, to a ready to run state. If it's unsuccessful, then certain pieces of the model may be white, right? So they're not ready to run. So you need to go and figure out what the possible problem is. Okay, maybe the geodatabase that you're trying to write to doesn't exist. Um, lots of different possibilities there. It's always important to validate your model, especially if you're getting it from somebody. So if you get a model, don't just take it at face value that it's ready to go, right? Just because it looks like it might be ready to go um, doesn't mean that it necessarily is. Okay, so definitely use the validate for that. Now, creating model tools. So we created a model, we open it up in Model Builder, and we can go ahead and just, you know, hit the little play button and it runs the model for us, right? Well, all models are essentially tools, okay? Mm -hmm. They are a tool in the toolbox. They just have a different, little different icon and they may be uh, a workflow of multiple tools. <coughs> So, if you've ever received a model or created a model and double clicked on it in Toolbox and you get this dialog with nothing in it, right? It says this tool has no parameters, okay? That means that nothing was built into the model that you need to fill in. You can just hit OK and the model runs, right? However, you can change that and actually go and make a model so that it has parameters that you can fill in on the fly. So if you have buffer in your model, you may want to change the distance. You know, today I might run it on 2,600 feet, tomorrow I might run it on 3,000 feet or 1,000 feet. I don't want to have to go into the model itself, open it all up, find that little parameter in the buffer tool and change that. I can expose that to a dialog, to a tool dialog. Okay, so that's the difference that we're seeing on the, on the screen here. We have one tool on the left hand side that has absolutely no parameters in it, so I don't have to fill in anything, I can just hit OK. The one on the right side, we actually have to fill in some information because they've exposed those pieces of that model to a dialog for me. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that. So that's, if you ever look at a model and you see the little P beside, um, pieces of the model, that's the parameter. It means that this item or element in the model is actually a parameter in that model. So when you double click on it and open up that dialog, you're going to see something there that you need to fill in. 
Okay. Um, it is important too to watch out because if you uh, create something as a parameter in your model, um, the name that is on that oval or that element is actually going to be the name that's used in the dialog. Okay. So you want to make that something descriptive, right? And that's why I was renaming some of those items. You can also go and create variables from actual parameters inside of a tool. Okay? So Model Builder will allow you to go and create variables for inputs. Right? So whether that's the distance on a buffer or that's a uh, workspace uh, or a geodatabase location or a folder that you're going to output your data sets to. Um, so all we need to do is go and right click on the actual tool. If it's a buffer tool, I can go right click on it, make variable from parameter and choose distance or whatever other parameters are in there. And I'll show you how to do this. All right, so let's go ahead and make a model tool. You guys are all very quiet. Hopefully lunch isn't you know, making you fall asleep or I'm not incredibly boring. All right, so we're back in our vulnerability model here, and I'm going to go ahead and actually make a tool out of this. So a few things that I may want to do. I have a buffer of my hazmat routes. Um, what I can do here is right-click on that tool, make a variable from a parameter. And look, I have all the different sort of possible parameters inside of my tool. So I'm going to actually go and check off distance here, and you'll notice on my... Uh, model, it makes this new extra little element. Okay, that's a variable element. It's, it's a light blue color. And right now, I'm going to open that up, and I currently have sort of a default in there set to 2600 feet. Okay. So what I'm going to do is make this a model parameter, and you now see the little P beside it, and I can go ahead and rename this. So this is going to be my buffer distance. Okay, so we'll just expand this out a little bit so we can see it. All right, so I save this, and if I go back into um, my toolbox here, and I double-click on this model, it exposes that as a parameter. So now I can, on the fly, very quickly, go ahead and change that buffer distance. I don't have to go back into the actual model interface every time and do that. Right? And notice it took on the name that I had in there, buffer distance. That's what I named the element as. Okay. So a few different options there. Um, you can also go ahead and make outputs model parameters. Okay. So I'm going to check this off as a model parameter. And here I have the little P. Okay. And uh, so we'll save that one and I'll show you again. Now I have an additional parameter, okay, my potential shelters, and notice it has the output, right? So I called them potential school shelters in my Scratch Geo database. Now the nice thing about this, if you want to sort of modify this dialog a little bit, um, we can go into the properties of this model and go to that parameters tab that I skipped over at the beginning. Okay, so here's the name of those parameters. Um, maybe I want to go ahead and move these. So I can change this one, the buffer distance down to the bottom. Um, the type, whether it's required or optional, if it is a parameter from a tool, like distance, that's a required parameter in order to run the buffer tool. I can't go and change that in this dialog. Okay? It's going to be required in order to run this, this tool. Right? So we'll hit OK, and now if I double click on it, now you can see that my potential shelters are now at the top and then my buffer distance. Okay, so a nice way of making a tool. Something else that was added at ArcGIS 10 is the ability to then go ahead and take that, pull it sort of out of uh, the toolbox itself and put it on a toolbar. So I can go and open up my customized dialog box where I can find all these fun commands that uh, won't fit on toolbars all the time. And I can go to my geoprocessing tools and I can go ahead and add the tool so here we have our tools and my vulnerability model. And then I can go and drag and drop that. Right? I can change some information. So if I want maybe the, uh, just the name of it, I can change the name. Um, let's do text only. Hit close. And now I can run that tool just from, from a, a toolbar. Okay, kind of nice. And you can do that pretty much with all of your geoprocessing tools, scripts and things like that, too. Okay, I thought that was kind of fun because, you know, I don't want to have to find it in the toolbox all the time. Right. Okay. 
All right, some tips for designing and sharing your models. Intermediate data. So what happens to all that data that gets generated on these little intermediate steps to get to your final result? So I ran a model with two buffers and a union, and then I have an erase tool, right? That erase tool is really going to generate the result that I want. Those buffers and unions, though, that's just some intermediate processing to get to that. I don't necessarily want to keep around that intermediate data, right? It's kind of junk to me. So I may run it, you know, dump it into a scratch workspace, but then I probably have to go and clean that up. Well, model, model builder by default sets those intermediate pieces to intermediate data, okay? They do that by default. So that way, you kind of can go and clean that up very easily at the end. Um, the final output never gets set to intermediate data, though. Okay, so that's a good thing, because in case you forget to turn off that default, um, at least you'll have your final output, right? You may be screaming at the software because you don't have the intermediate, but that's okay. Um, all right, a couple things about this, though. Um, if you're in the model builder window, the actual dialog, and working in the model there, and then run it from there, the intermediate data does not get automatically deleted. You have to go up to the model menu and explicitly click delete intermediate data. Okay? If you run the model as a tool, I double click on the model, and you have intermediate data set, the tool will actually go and clean up the intermediate data on its own after. Okay? So you don't have to do the additional step. So the story here is make sure that you have only the appropriate things that you want to be deleted as set as your intermediate data, right? Because maybe I do want all those extra intermediate results, all those little buffers and, and unions that I do there. So just some tips for managing that intermediate data. A couple don'ts. Do not write the, <laughs> your intermediate data to an SDE geodatabase, an enterprise geodatabase, um, because every time you want to go and delete that, it has to go back out to the enterprise geodatabase to do it. Okay? You may not have permissions to delete stuff in that geodatabase. Right? That's going to cause some problems. Okay? Um, remote data, do not put it in a really, like in a remote... Um, data set or on a network drive somewhere, try and keep that stuff local, okay? Your final result can go out to something that's remote, but try and keep the intermediate stuff local because if you're cleaning it up, it's a lot easier to clean it up locally on your machine rather than having to go and hit an external drive somewhere, right? Um, don't clutter your permanent results database. So if you have a, a permanent database and you're trying to write your results to that, don't clutter it up with all this intermediate stuff. Put that stuff in a scratch database, right? You have the ability to make these file geodatabases, you know, whenever you want, generally. Um, so why not create a scratch geodatabase that you dump all of your intermediate work to? Right? I was his, you know, really, really bad uh, back in the days with my shapefile 1, shapefile 2, shapefile 3, and they were all in a junk folder. And a year later, I finally looked at that junk folder, couldn't figure out if anything was even useful. Uh, so try not to clutter up uh, your workspaces. Okay? So use a scratch. All right. The other neat thing that you can do here is you can take models that you create and embed them in other models. Okay, so nesting models. Um, the, the really nice thing about this is that if you have an extremely complex model, right, you're running 20 different tools, you can actually break that model up into smaller pieces and have certain pieces run. So for example, if I take in a bunch of CAD data, I need to convert that to a geodatabase, and then I'm going to run some other processes, I may want to go and have the conversion as its own model, and then some other additional processes as a separate model, and pull them all together into a third sort of overall, this is my tool, okay? Um, so it's really easy to do this. Uh, you, can, um, you can do this at any point with any type of model, tool that you have, script tools, things like that. Um, and it's also nice if you have to collaborate with a bunch of people and you're, you're uh, individually working on different pieces. Right. Some tips for running models. Um, Running models from Model Builder. As I said, intermediate data is not automatically deleted, so you need to go and actually do this on your own. Um, 
the add to display when you go and right click on a um, output and you say add to display it adds that to the map okay um, no background geoprocessing here so we have the ability to turn on and off a background geoprocessing I don't know if many of you have heard of this um, but if you have a pretty complex process and you need to you know run it for a few hours but you don't want it to interrupt what you're doing in ArcMap or Arc Catalog you can run it in the background and then you'll get a little little pop-up at the bottom of your screen telling you that hey this model ran and it'll give you a checkbox if it went okay or an X if it went really bad. Um, however, if you're running the, the actual uh, tool inside the model builder window, it will not run in the background at all. It always runs in the foreground on the screen. Okay. Um, if you're running it as a tool, the intermediate data is automatically deleted. So again, I said, make sure that you only have that option set for the actual intermediate pieces that you don't want later on. Okay. Um, another sort of... Uh, trick when you add to display and you're running it as a tool that element that output element that you have you need to not only check off the add to display but you also need to make that output um, a model parameter it has to have the little p beside it okay then you can double click on the tool and run it and it'll add to the display for you so one extra little piece that you need to do there um, and then you do have the option to run things in the foreground Okay, or the background uh, if you're running it as a tool. So it's up to you. Definitely design your models to be shareable. Okay, so make them pretty flexible, maybe not as data dependent um, if you're going to be sharing them. Um, set environment settings, relative paths, and so on. There is a really good read about tips for distributing models. I recommend reading that if you have to go and share your models and distribute them. Okay. Um, make sure your layout looks decent. You can also add some additional pieces to your layout. You can add labels on items um, so to give some more clarity as to what those things are doing. And then new at 10, we had this item descriptions that were added, kind of like a metadata. You can go and add item descriptions to your models. Right? You can also create help documentation. Um, in terms of modifying the layout, you have a lot of different options there to sort of move things around. It does not affect the order that tools run in, right? They'll still run in the order that you have them all connected, even if they're all over the place in terms of your layout, okay? And you have a couple different modes here with your layouts. Um, you can go ahead and have an automatic. So if I click that little blue and green button that we're seeing here, it'll automatically go and lay out my, my tools for me. Um, or I can have a manual mode where I actually determine how everything is going to be laid out. Okay? And there are some options for that. So if you go to the diagram properties of the model, you have options, whether you orient them from left to right, right to left, center, whatever you want to do with them. Okay? And this is all for layout, does not affect how the model actually runs itself. And documenting. So as I said, you can make labels. You can make some free-floating labels if you want, just floating around, maybe a title, something like that. Um, you can make some element labels. So if you put a, want to put a little label beside um, one of the elements in the model to uh, describe things, you can also create labels on connectors. So those little connector lines that you see, right? You can make some labels on those as well. This is all really good practice for documenting your model, right? If you're just going to use the model as your own little process that you run, you probably don't have to do all of this. Um, but I recommend doing it, you know, just down the road if you have a few minutes, just so that if you have to go on vacation or leave your job, at least somebody has something to work with. Um, another neat thing is you may have seen on my first model that instead of just having little ovals, I had little images, right? Little JPEGs in there. Um, so you can go and change these elements to what we call like picture elements. Um, and you can go and choose a JPEG or a GIF or something like that and, and sort of create a little snapshot of maybe what that data looks like. All right. So just to show you really quick, let's go ahead and open up our model. How are we doing for time here? 15 minutes, right? All right. So I can do a few things here if I wanted to go ahead and change this to a picture symbol. Okay, I can go and find, see there's my junk. I still have a junk folder. <laughs> All right. So we can go into our, um, 
can see here. And I did that on my hazmat routes. So I have a little JPEG, right? And then I can go ahead and change the size of that if I want. Okay, do lots of things in there. Um, I can also create little labels. So I can create a label and go and change the, what's in here? Display properties. Yep. And we can go and change the, the font and all sorts of things. Okay. You can create labels on connectors too. So if I highlight a little connector and do create a label, it'll create a label next to my connector. Okay. Just nice little ways of, of sort of documenting. Um, and as I said, you can also go ahead and go to the model properties and put in some help information in here as well. Okay. You can generate a little help file. Um, and you can also give the, uh, the model some additional um, descriptive information. All right, learning more. So since you've been so quiet, we might actually end early, which means that you can probably come up and ask questions. Um, ArcGIS Online, okay? So through the Resource Center, you can get to the help very easily. Um, you can get to, if you're still working in 9.3 or a previous version, there are, is that help online, or you can go to the 10 version help. Um, I recommend going to the online help as your sort of first location um, because the help that comes with the software doesn't get updated as often, right? It gets updated when you install things like service packs and, and stuff like that. So the online help is always going to be a little more up to date. The Geoprocessing Resource Center. If you haven't gone here and you have to do geoprocessing, you have to create scripts, you have to create models, go to the Geoprocessing Resource Center. And just because I love it and I want to show it to you, we'll go to resources.arcgis.com. Scroll down to the bottom and hit the Geoprocessing. Okay, and here's your Geoprocessing Resource Center. So lots of stuff you can find in here. Um, there's presentations that you can get access to. There's a model and script tool gallery. Really neat things in here, okay? I'm learning more and more because I only come here once a year and I get to go and then sit with all the development people and know what they've put up there and they've put some really fantastic things up there, okay? And you can go and add your stuff to this too. If you've made a really neat model and you want to share it um, because you worked so hard on it and you think it'd be useful to other people, you can go and add to this, this resource center as well. Um, you can also go to the forums directly through here. There's a geoprocessing blog. Okay, So go and check this out. If you do anything else in ArcGIS, if you're part of sort of a community, you do local government or you do water utilities, the resource center is your friend. The best place to go to get a lot of information very quickly. Okay. And no, I don't get paid to just plug the resource center. Um, I just actually really do love it. All right, so getting more at the conference. Um, okay, we're here Wednesday, so I guess that first one is, is uh, a mute point. But building tools with Model Builder. Okay, we had a session this morning, and there's going to be another one tomorrow afternoon. That is the advanced Model Builder session, if you want, you know, sort of the quick and dirty. Um, it gives you a lot of additional pieces, building actual tools and really building on what I did uh, this afternoon. And then also come to this, the Spatial Analysis Showcase. We have a lot of really good people there to help you out and, you know, show you how to build models, if you have specific questions on problems that you want to solve. Um, also, if you just have tools that you want to learn a little more about, uh, definitely come down there. Okay, And we can handle all sorts of questions from all over the place. A um, couple other things, instructor-led training. Okay, We do have a few courses that, that cover model builder in little pieces. There's also some live seminars and recordings. There's a free one, I think it's 60 minutes, on um, building models and model builder. And then there was a new book that just came out, Getting to Know ArcGIS Model Builder. Okay. Um, I believe it is down in the spatial outlet, so you can go and check it out there. It is your introduction to advanced model building. Um, and I think this is the first book that we've actually had that is all about model builder. Okay, So I would go and check it out. I haven't really looked at the book too much, but I've heard some really good things about it, and I met the author yesterday morning. Um, he's wandering around. Okay, So definitely go and check that out if you need some really good resources for model builder. And before you leave... Um, take down this web 
uh, address. So you want to go to the Esri page and go to the session evals in order to evaluate the session um, that I presented. Okay, and that includes me. I am always open to feedback, and uh, also just what you want to see in sessions and, and whether it was useful. All right, so have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the rest of your conference.